Good morning, church. I hope we're doing great this morning. If you would stand. We're learning a new song first thing this morning, and it's all about having joy in the house of the Lord. So is there joy in the house of the Lord this morning? Amen. Amen. If you would, let's raise our hands. Father God, we praise you and we worship you this morning. Thank you for being in this place. Thank you for uh, your Holy Spirit being here with us. I pray that you would forgive us where we have failed you this week, God. But we come before you in the power of the Holy Spirit to raise up your great and your holy and your glorious name. Jesus, we praise you. We worship you. We thank you for all the wonderful deeds that you have done. And we praise you now in song. In Jesus' name, amen. Church, let's sing together.
Assembly of God Church. My name is Michaela, and we're so glad you chose to worship with us this morning. Before we keep going, let's take a look at a few upcoming announcements. We are so excited to welcome all of our first time guests this morning. Make sure you pick up a welcome bag and meet us in the connection room after service. Our staff and team would love to meet with you and welcome you to our church. There are a couple ways you can give your tithes and offering this morning. You can give online at our website at brokenbowfirst.org, at the baskets up front, or in the boxes in the back. Thank you for your continued giving. Tonight is our skate night at the Rocket Roller Rink in Idaville. Join us from 6 to 8 p.m. for a great night of fellowship and skating. Small concessions will be available for purchase, but you're more than welcome to bring your own food. If you're in need of transportation, our vans will be leaving at 5.30. Our next focus night is July 11th at 6 o'clock here in the main sanctuary. Join us for a short time of worship and to hear an encouraging word from one of our staff pastors. Our women's ministry will be having their monthly dinner fellowship on Monday, July 12th at 6.30 p.m. in the FLC. Ladies, you won't want to miss this great meal and discussion. Make plans now to attend and invite a friend. For any questions, please see Renee Short. For more information on these or any other upcoming announcements, you can check our website at brokenbowfirst.org, follow us on Facebook, or watch us on YouTube. We also have summer schedules available for you out in the lobby. God bless you today and enjoy the rest of your service. Church, if you would, let's stand and continue in a time of worship. And we're going to be reading probably one of my favorite passages um, in the Old Testament. Um, for context, God's people had been in captivity for hundreds of years. And they had just been led out of captivity by Moses. And they were being pursued by Pharaoh and his men. And Moses said to the people, don't be afraid. Stand firm and see the Lord's salvation that he will accomplish for you today. And this is what encourages me so much this morning. For the Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. Amen. The Lord will fight for you and you need only to be quiet. And so the, these were slaves. These weren't soldiers. But they're being pursued by an enemy. And what do they do? They let the Lord fight for them. How do we let the Lord fight for us this morning? By surrendering to him. By proclaiming authority in him. By worshiping him. By reaching out to him in prayer and petition to him. So as we do that this morning, church, the enemy that we face today, there is coming a day very soon we will no longer see them. And so right now, let's just lift our hands and praise to our Father God. Jesus, thank you so much for leading us out of captivity. God, we, because of you, we are no longer a slave to our sin. We are no longer a slave to our passions or the things that once held us captive. God, we are free and we are alive in you. Jesus, we worship you this morning because you are the only one um, who is worthy to be called Savior. You are worthy of the name Savior. Jesus, we give you the praise and we give you the glory as we sing this morning.
get you, God. I'll sing of all you've done. Death is swallowed up forever by the fury of your love. Sing that again. You stepped into my Egypt and you took me by the hand. Then you marched me out in freedom into the promised land. And now I will not forget you, God. I'll sing of all you've done. Swallowed up forever the fury of the
whether large or small, whatever that might be in your life, God, we serve a God who is touched by the very feelings of our infirmities, our struggles. I'm glad he's there to hold us up. In our weakness, we become strong in him. God's grace is so amazing, isn't it? Today, I want to I want to do something a little bit different this morning. I want to uh, ask the Clampett family to come to the front here this morning. I don't know if you know it or not. Maybe you've seen it on Facebook or something. Um, Clinton Kimberly's little daughter, uh, Lily, was bucked off of a horse on Friday, I believe it was, uh, Thursday or Friday, and uh, was met a flight, about seven o'clock at night, was met a flighted to Dallas Children's Hospital and uh, had been released since, but suffered some pretty good bruising and uh, was beaten up a little bit. Also has uh, suffered some concussions and is still going through some concussion protocol a little bit. So they're guarding her and watching over her. But I'm going to ask uh, Carolyn and, and Clint and John just to come down. And we want to pray for them and pray for can you imagine what might be going through your mind if that was your little daughter got bucked off a horse and perhaps uh, suffering some serious injuries? And we just want to uplift them this morning. I'm going to ask my wife to come, and we're just going to pray and believe God for a, not only healing, but a total recovery. How many, how many believe for a total recovery this morning? Uh, they were telling me, uh, Kimberly was texting me last night and saying that that uh, Lily has no recollection of what happened. Uh, that's a good thing. We might be a little concerned about it, but that's a good thing because we don't want her to be afraid to get back on that horse again. Amen? And uh, so would you this morning, would you just stretch out your hand toward this family this morning? We believe that God has a purpose and a plan for Lily's life, and uh, he's not through with her. So would you, would you join me in prayer this morning? We just believe that God has a purpose and a plan, even in the setbacks and the struggles, that God's got something great in store. Amen. Praise the Lord. You may be seated this morning. Good to have you with us today. Good to see you this morning. This is right in the middle of vacation season. We know that. We understand that. But God is a good God. He's here anyway. Amen. Praise the Lord. Good to have you with us this morning. Praise the Lord. Tonight, I just want to encourage you. Uh, I want to encourage you. I lost the lights. Did we lose the lights on? I feel like I'm in the dark. Um, I just want to encourage you this morning um, to join us this evening. This is our summer activities. We do the focus month, the family night, the friends night, and then the fellowship night. Tonight is fellowship. Now, I'm 65 years old, and I'm not going to dare get on those roller skates. 
I'm not going to dare get on those roller skates. I love my body more than that. And I love those around me more than that because I will wipe you out, no doubt. But I encourage you to come this evening and uh, join us. Bring your kiddos. And it's all paid. No expense to you. Uh, we're renting the, the roller skating rink in, in Idabel. And uh, our church is paying that just for us to have a great time of fellowship together. So bring your family and let's come and enjoy fellowship together. Now, if you don't skate, uh, I invite you to uh, do something else. Bring some, bring some games with you. Uh, there'll be some tables there for us to play some games, maybe some, uh, some Uno or some Phase 10. I got wicked at Phase 10 during vacation. I'm a killer at Phase 10 now. But you gotta, you got to play by my rules. If you're going to play, you got to play by my rules on this Phase 10 stuff. But, but we're going to play little games there. If we have fellowship together, this is all about fellowship. It's not about roller skating. It's about fellowship. And we're just providing a rink for you to enjoy that in. So come and join us tonight. It's from 6 to 8, we have the roller skate rink uh, reserved. So come and join us. We'll have a great time of fellowship together. And uh, I'm going to beat somebody in Phase 10. I'm going to be somebody in phase 10. Amen. Praise the Lord. We are delighted this morning to have a, just a wonderful couple with us today. I, uh, I met, I love missionaries. I love missionaries because I love the work that they do. They're just an extension of our church. They're not isolated. They're not on their own. They're an extension of you and I. And I met this young man in sectional council in, uh, February, I think, or March, he came to our church for our sectional meetings, and um, just something immediately jumped out about him, his personality, his demeanor, his, just his love for the Lord, just, just attached himself to me. I, I love this young man. I've only been around him a couple times now, but I, have, I sense a real spirit of the Lord in his life, and we're excited to have uh, Jordan and Shay Campbell, and uh, the best part of their family is in the nursery this morning. She is a doll. In fact, if you just will lock that nursery door and leave her in there, when they leave, I'll take her to Raisin. <laughs> She's a grandpappy's baby. I can tell you that right now. She is a doll. Uh, her name is Delaney, and uh, that must mean princess in some language. I'm not sure. But uh, it's a joy and a privilege to have with us this morning, Jordan and Shay Campbell. Uh, they are missionaries. Uh, they have been missionary assistants, and now they are going um, for their first term as a missionary to Germany. And uh, that, those, that means two things to me. Number one, they're going for military, and I'm sort of attached to the military. And number two, I'm about three-quarter German. Well, not three-quarter, about a quarter German, maybe. Most of me is German. <clears throat> the bad part of me is German. <clears throat> so uh, I'm delighted to have uh, this couple with us this morning. I'm going to invite Jordan just to come and share with us. We'll take up an offering at the end of the service this morning. We'll pass the plate. We haven't been doing that, but we'll pass the plate for him to, uh, for us to receive an offering for them. So Jordan, would you come this morning? We're just delighted to have you and Shay with us today. Would you welcome him this morning? Well, good morning, church. Good morning, church. Okay, all right, making sure everyone's awake and alive. Um, well, uh, I want to share a little bit about us, if that's okay, and then I'm just going to preach. Is that fine? I, I really believe God has given me a word for all of you, um, and I'm really excited. I get a little giddy, okay? So I'm feeling giddy this morning. I'm a little weird, okay? So just want to let you know. First and foremost, I'm a little strange, but it's okay, all right? I won't come and launch myself in the pew chairs or anything else. Um, before I start, I do want to say thank you so much for inviting me. Um, Pastor Terry is awesome. Um, I, I, I remember meeting for the first time at sexual councils, and he was just so honest and transparent. Um, and it was, it's really refreshing um, because, you know, a lot of ministers and everything, they're always like, oh, just trust in God and just keep moving along. And it's sometimes we can just be like, God's... 
I'm struggling too, and uh, this is hard, and I really appreciate that you have a pastor that's honest, um, that doesn't just put up a front for everyone to see, but is, but is who he is inside and outside of this church and in his real life. So thank you, Pastor Terry, for, for being so honest, and, and I do feel loved, and I love you too. And yeah, and Delaney's name is a princess in Swahili. Um, I'm just kidding. It's really not, not, not at all. Just, just one mess of you guys. Um, but anyways, we are missionaries to our U.S. military. We just spent the last two years in Stuttgart, Germany as family pastors at a military outreach church. So we had the honor of discipling kids and youth, and then we got to lead the church during the summers. And so we got to be pretty familiar with military ministry. And guys, I just want to be honest with you um, because I'm going to do my best to be transparent as well. I love meeting like this corporately. Do you love coming to church, being able to worship with your family? And we in America have that privilege because someone is fighting for you to be able to sit in here right now. Someone died for you to be able to sit in here right now. And I think we take that for granted. And sometimes I think we should slap ourselves on the hands of not wanting to stand up or not wanting to sing praises when our other brothers and sisters around the world do that. And if they get caught, they get killed. Let's not take that for granted. Amen. And so for all of these troops, I think, and I hope you do too, that they deserve to hear the gospel. Amen. You know, there are, in just in Europe alone, there's over 200,000 troops, probably not even including all of their family members that they take with them. And do you know how many Assembly God churches we have for these 200,000 troops? Two. We have two. And they're not huge. They're not being reached. Who's fighting for them? They're out there giving their all, and we're not sending anyone to go. So the Assemblies of God started something up called AGWM Military Ministries, and it's ministry to these troops overseas because they deserve to hear the gospel. We're going to a place, we, we were in Stuttgart, um, and we were praying, God, where do you want us to go? Because we wanted to plant a military church. We saw the need, but there are so many bases, so many posts that are military at in Europe, and we just got, God, you've got to highlight. And he highlighted one called Grafenvir, and we got to have a private tour from an Air Force colonel. She, t she took us around and showed us the whole place. And it was it's an extremely, extremely young demographic. And I want to share two sides of this coin that's in Grafenvir where we're going to go plant a church, okay? So for one, Grafenvir is a very, very um, old post that the military uses. It's the largest NATO training facility outside of the U.S. And it's one of the largest training facilities the Army has, or the U.S. military has, outside of the United States. So what does that mean? There are a lot of troops that go through there. If you're stationed overseas, you go through here to train. And so you have part of the base, there are part of the post and the soldiers there and their families there that are stationed there for about three years at a time. And they are known as the QRF or Quick Reaction Force of Europe and Africa. What does that mean in layman terms? If anything crazy happens in Europe and Africa, they are the first ones to go and fight. They were the first ones to go. And I wanted to show you a picture of one of our special operations troops um, on the screen. It'll pop up behind me. I wanted you to get a visual of what these guys do and train and look like on a daily basis. Because for them, war is not an if, but a when. They are training for when I'm going to go into battle. When I'm going to be shot at. When I'm going to have to deal with these things. And so you have half the coin in the graph where they're stationed for three years at a time training. And then the other half, they have thousands upon thousands of troops that come through their units for weeks or months at a time to train and immediately go to a conflict. So both sides of the coin, they're ready for action. They're ready for combat. And if you've noticed with our veterans, if you've noticed with people that have come back, they have some things they struggle with. Amen? In the military culture, though I love the military, I served in the military. It is a dark culture where pornography is normal. Infidelity is normal. Everything is celebrated and mourned with alcoholism. Like there are crazy, crazy addictions. Don't they deserve to hear the gospel? We want to plant this church. We want to be a part of what God is going to do. And, and we want to see, you know, because we see all these people that come back from overseas and their struggle with PTSD and all these issues and alcoholism. What if, 
we get them while they're young. This base is full of young troops and young families. What if they put Christ in their marriage first? Before they have to deal with all these things, before they have to deal with the separation and anxiety, they know how to pray. They are filled with the Holy Spirit. They train their kids up to know and love Jesus, that God is central in their lives, not something that he's, he's okay, we're going to go to God at the very end. When everything's failed, we'll give him a try. What if he's first? What if they're in the battlefield and they pray and God does a miracle on, on, on the field where they're fighting? He saves someone. I don't know. I don't know. But I know they need to hear the gospel. And I know there's not very many people going to them. So for us, as long as there are men and women fighting for our freedoms, we're going to do everything we can to fight for their souls. They deserve to know Jesus. They deserve to know they are loved by Jesus and that there is hope in him. When everything else seems dark and it seems like you're completely alone, that he is right there. Always right there. Amen? So I, I have a few things that I would love you guys to take on the table outside in the foyer um, when you leave. We have prayer cards. Um, I would love for each and every one of you to pick this up. Um, and, and it allows you to remember to pray for us. Um, it has our information on it. You can become partners with us. Um, whatever God convicts you to do, whatever he does, we, we, we appreciate everything. Um, and most importantly, I want you to take one of these little soldiers um, anybody play with these when they were younger? They've gotten smaller. Okay, so just to let you know, they've gotten a little smaller. Okay, I've seen some big guys. Um, so these, uh, these are a little different. But I want you to grab one of these, and I don't want you to just take it and put it in your pocket. I want you to put it where you pray. Because they're, I, I want it to be a reminder to pray for our troops. To pray. You know, there's a lot of moms that send their young kids off to war, and they're praying. They need some assistance. We as a body have got to cover these guys and girls in uniform, to cover their families, their kids that are stripped from what is normal. And now they're in a new country, in a new context, and, and mommy and daddy's not always around. They need Jesus. Amen? So would you do that? Would you grab one of these and remember to pray for our troops and then hopefully pray for, for more people to be called to reach our military? Amen? Amen. All right. Uh, uh, before I preach, I just want to pray. Um, so if you would pray with me, okay? Lord Jesus, we love you so much. God, we thank you that we're able to be here and to hear from you. Holy Spirit, I just ask that you would just speak through me, um, that you would just say whatever you want to say, um, that you would open up every heart and mind to receive exactly what you want them to receive, Lord Jesus, that you would convict us, you would encourage us, you would challenge us, you would do whatever you want to do, Lord God. We surrender this service to you, and we love you. And everyone says, amen. Amen. Like I said, I'm excited, okay? All right, so I promise I won't preach, you know, till like one o'clock or something, all right? I know bellies get hungry, all right? Um, but God gave me this word, um, and he started with my wife first, this word called remnant. And it's something that God birthed in my wife first, my lovely wife, Shay, who is way more awesome than I am. Um, and she can preach it down, tell you what, all right? But anyways, I'm up here today, okay? So you get me, sorry. Um, but uh, this, this word remnant, um, and it, it started birthing in Shay first, and then we started talking about it, and we believed it was a word God was giving us for the community we were going to. And so we looked up, what does remnant mean? Um, it actually means, it's in, in the dictionary, it says the remaining part, or what will remain, Okay? Biblically, though, it's defined as what is left of a community after it undergoes a catastrophe. So biblically, it's those that continue to serve God when life gets really crazy, when life gets really hard, when that, answer, when that prayer isn't completely answered in the timing and way you wanted it, when you thought your parents were going to stay together forever. When you thought this thing you were going to be addicted to was going to be broken off, whatever it is, those that continue to serve Jesus, continue to trust in God, those are the remnant. And so I want to start reading um, in Romans chapter 9, verses 25 through 27. And when you're there, say amen. If not, it'll be on the Sky Bible. I didn't hear any amens, so I'm waiting. You, you sure y'all are awake? I can get weirder, okay? All right, verse 25. Concerning the Gentiles, God says in the prophecy of Hosea, those who are not my people, I will now call my people. And I will love those whom I did not love before. 
And then at the place where they were told, you are not my people, there they will be called children of the living God. And concerning Israel, Isaiah the prophet cried out, though the people of Israel are as numerous as the sand of the seashore, only a remnant will be saved. There's that word remnant. And so when you look at it, the remnant are those that continue to put their faith in Jesus. Amen? Amen? Salvation is for everyone. That's good news, right? Because I'm not a Jew. I'm not an Israelite. But yet God sent Jesus for me too, right? He sent it for you. I want, I want to ask a real question, okay? Who sinned this week? Raise your hand. If you're not raising your hand, it's called being self-righteous. Slip to the other slides, Rustin. We got a different sermon to talk about. I'm just kidding, right? We all sin. We all make mistakes, amen? Right? And yet God still chooses to love us. He chooses to forgive us. He chooses to walk it out with us. That's our God. That's amazing. And so when we continue to put our trust in Jesus, when we fall down and we continue to say, God, forgive me, help me. Help me to continue. Help me to continue to trust you. He is still there. And Shay and I, our family, we are under the conviction that there will be a remnant of God's people in Grafenveer, Germany. That there will be those that will hear the gospel and cling on to Jesus for the rest of their lives. That marriages will be transformed, that addictions will fall off, that kids will grow up to know Jesus and have a chance against the powers of darkness that are constantly plaguing them. Have you looked at our world lately? It's getting pretty dark, right? And, and, and I don't know, I, I know we're going to struggle, right? But I know our military struggles too. And we, we need, they need to hear the gospel. That's why we have to go, amen? But it's this remnant of people. And so I, I was looking at, you know, the remnant of people and God chose Israel. And I was wondering, what made Israel so special? Do you ever wonder that? Do you ever read the Bible? And do you read the Bible and not know exactly what's going on sometimes? Does anybody else have that? Anybody? Y'all are all biblical scholars? Okay, there's a few of you that got it all figured out. Um, so for me, I looked at Abraham or Abram. And I looked at why did God choose him? And he called Abram, right? And he called him to leave and go. And God didn't tell him where he was going to go or how long it was going to take or truly what everything was going to look like. But Abraham was willing to follow. That's the remnant. It's Jesus, I don't know where you're taking me. I don't know what's going to happen. I don't understand it, but I'm willing to go. Shay and I, we're going to a place where we don't know anyone, nobody. We don't have any connections. We never planted a church before. We don't have a church building. We don't have a worship team, right? All of these things that you would think you need for, we don't have any of those, but we are willing to go. And I wonder what God is calling you to go. Where is he asking you to trust him to be his remnant? What are you willing to sacrifice to be that remnant? Because God calls many, but only if you accept. Amen? That's why the remnant is so small, because not everyone is willing to trust Jesus that much. Has anyone else been there? Yeah? Good, good, good. And so for wanting to see this remnant happen... In Grafenbeer, God's been challenging my heart. And he's been challenging me and Shay and saying, you've got to be that remnant first. You know, a lot of times we as Christians, we, we know just enough scripture to be able to point and say, that's wrong. You're messed up. Not supposed to do that. Read that last week or something, right? Doesn't that happen? But instead of looking inside first, it's like, God, where am I off? Where am I making mistakes? And so I came across this, this statistic um, that 10% of Christians that claim they're Christians accepted Jesus inside a church building. What does that mean? 90% of people that came to know Jesus as Lord, it happened outside of these walls. How you live and how you share the gospel matters. The kingdom advances mainly, according to statistics, outside of these walls. I mean, I think it's great. Bring your unsaved neighbor to church and have them freak out sometimes, right? Because some weird stuff happens in church, 
okay? Especially when you're not familiar. Someone starts speaking in tongues. They're like, I'm going to cover you in the blood. You're like, no, you're not. What are you talking about? You know what I mean? You tell that to a sinner. It's like, I don't know what you're saying, man. Really freaking me out. But it's, it's your day-to-day with that person. It's you loving them where they're at. It's you praying for them in the moment. It's you living out the gospel in front of them. That's what makes a difference. I think a lot of times we think we just bring them to church and the pastor will say an awesome message and just Holy Spirit convict and then they're going to come down and, and accept Jesus and then, all right, bye. But that's not the biblical model for discipleship. We're called to make disciples, not professing Christians. Amen? That means there's work involved on your part. Biblically, the church is to equip and edify the saints so that you can go do ministry. Who are you discipling? Who have you taken under your wing that you have shared Jesus, you walk through scripture, you pray with them, you live it out, they know they can trust you? Or are we more happy being consumers that just come to church, feed me, feed me, oh, I want to sing a really good worship song. Do you realize that that has kind of shifted into the culture of our churches? We're more worried about what, what pleases us, what's for us, what helps us, rather than we are going out and helping. We're coming to church, so what do you need? What do they need? What can I do? How can I serve? Do you model this? Because that's basic Christianity. And if you believe in any other version other than this and self-sacrifice, then someone's told you something wrong. And you have not been in your word to notice. Amen? You remember when you start school? And, uh, you know, for me, the first day of school, I was, I was really vain um, when I was younger. Um, uh, and so I would want to wear my best clothes the first day. Anyone else do that? Your mom and dad got your best clothes. You did it for your kids. And you wear your nicest shirt, your nicest pants and shoes or whatever it was. And you're like, I look good. I look good today. And you want everyone to see you, right? You're excited about this new stuff you're wearing. But... Remember a couple weeks go by, a couple months go by, and those awesome clothes that were so new are now your normal play clothes? You ever have that? Did they ever transfer to your normal play clothes? And you weren't jumping in puddles with them before. Now you care less. You don't care. You can jump in the puddle. You can do whatever you want with them. I wonder if we treat the gospel message like that as Christians. That when we first came to know Jesus, when we first got saved, it was amazing. We realized the power of God. It was so simple, yet so powerful. But over time, we think it's watered down. And over time, maybe we don't share the gospel because like, oh, they've heard it before. It's nothing new. The same Holy Spirit that convicted and transformed you will use that same simple message of the gospel to transform someone else. If you would just be willing to stop worrying about what other people are going to think about you and walk this out. Amen? Am I stepping on your toes? Good. Hallelujah. We need to grow. We need to be challenged. Our world is getting really, really, really dark. And Jesus said, you are the light of the world. You want to see things change? Stand up and do something. Be that remnant biblically. Are you madly in love with Jesus? Only you can answer that. I can't do it for you. I don't know your heart. But if you're madly in love with Jesus, then everything flows from your relationship with him. You're willing, God, I don't, I don't care what you want me to do. I'll do it because I trust you. I may not like it. I may complain a lot, but I'm going to continue to follow you because I love you. Well, I mean, being a Christian is very, very difficult in your own strength. But if you're constantly connected with Jesus, he gives you that strength to equip you and help you. And he wants to use you if you would just be willing to say yes. Amen. So what does God desire from his remnant? This verse really stands out, and it's a big missionary verse we have in AGWM, and it's Micah 6, 8. You've probably heard it before. Um, it's, it's basically the context of the scripture is Israel's asking God, God, what do you want from us? You want us to sacrifice our sons and daughters? I mean, what do you want us to do? How do we serve you? And this is how God answers. He says, no, like don't, don't sacrifice your sons and daughters, right? I mean, we, we would think that's common sense, right? But like also abortion's really, really huge in our country right now. We got to fight that too. Amen. Amen. 
going to have a different sermon. No, O people, the Lord has told you what is good, and this is what he requires of you, to do what is right, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Let's leave it on there for just a second. This looks really simple, right? Right? Does it look really simple? It's really hard to live out, though. Amen. Can anyone attest to this? Do you walk this out every day? I didn't hear anybody, right? But it's so simple. And, and I think we make it really complex of what it means to follow Jesus when we can just really follow this, right? This in the Great Commission. But it's, it's, it's doing what is right is the simple fact of when you're saved, you have the Holy Spirit that comes and dwells within you. The same Holy Spirit, he, he lets you know exactly how to live. He uses scripture to correct you. And so it's not that you don't know what is right sometimes. It's that you just choose not to do what is right. Amen? Sometimes your road rage takes over. Anyone else? No one else? Right? I bet you. After this sermon, and you can cry and rededicate your life to Jesus. Someone's going to cut you off out there and <laughs> see where your faith is at. <laughs> There's always opportunities to grow. Amen? It's, <laughs> I don't know what you struggle with, but doing what is right is difficult. That's why you can't seclude yourself from Jesus. Because when you seclude yourself from Jesus, you don't have that power and authority. And also, Jesus called us to live in community with one another. So if you don't really know your church family, and you don't spend time with your church family, you ain't a community. That's why the pastor in this, this church is pushing for fellowship. You need to know each other. You need to help each other out. And if you're the one that's like, I got it all taken care of. I'm good. Well, guess what? Everybody else needs you. Because they need to figure out how to do this thing perfect all the time. Right? People need you. You need people. We are the body together. Amen. And I think what's funny about these verses is to do what is right, to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. And I think when we look at mercy, um, <laughs> for me, when I first read this, I think of mercy to sinners or mercy to people that are bad to me, right? Or whatever else. You know, when I first read this, I don't think of people in the church. Do you give mercy to people you're in church with? When they've stabbed you in the back or they've gossiped behind you or whatever else, do you give them mercy? Because I have seen, I didn't grow up churched, okay? So I'm coming in this a little late in the game. But I have seen worldly, secular, atheistic people love their neighbor way better than people that profess Christ. And we wonder why they choose to go to a bar or a house party or something because they feel welcomed. They feel loved. Someone will talk with them, give terrible advice, but they'll listen. And we bring them in the church and we say, you need to clean that up. You need to clean that up. You need to change the way you do this. You need to do that. And they're like, oh, or we just want to preach at them. You ever do that? Or you ever know that, that if it's not you, it's someone you know, right? It's that preacher Christian. Or do you come with a need and you're just trying to vent or get something off your chest? And they're like, well, let me tell you about 1 Corinthians 10. And it's like, no, I don't want to be preached at right now. I just want you to listen. I need someone to be there for me. And I wonder if we change the atmosphere of how merciful we are and we honor one another and lift each other up and encourage one another, that the world would want to be a part of the church. Because this whole thing that it seems to be the world's fighting for is love and unity. That's here. We have the answer. We just need to live it out and watch our communities transformed to really be the way, the truth, and the life, to let Jesus live out through us. Amen? So I look at someone who modeled this really well um, is Joseph. And you remember Joseph in the Old Testament? You know this guy? Okay, so he's, you know, he's sold into slavery by his brothers, and like, that's kind of messed up, but he was kind of arrogant, so maybe he had it coming, you know, I don't know. Um, but uh, so anyways, um, he's, he's dealing with slavery, and then he, he, you know, he gets into Potiphar's house, and he gets, you know, second status, like he's doing really well, and then he gets accused of, you know, adultery, which he didn't do. He was innocent, right? But he didn't have a victim mentality about it. He just dealt with it, moved on, and then now he's in prison again, and he's serving, and, and uh, the warden lets him, you know, be the leader in the prison. And so he is constantly going through ups and downs, 
but yet his faith is not wavering. He is still choosing to trust God, still choosing to love God, to honor God, and God gives him these spiritual gifts that elevates him for the sake of other people. Israel wouldn't even be here if Joseph wouldn't put into slavery and continue to trust God. He preserved the remnant of his family because he lived it out despite the circumstances that happened around him. Joseph is a great model for this. He did what is right. He did love mercy because he could have had his brothers and families killed. He chose to show them mercy and he walked humbly with God. He knew God was on the throne. He's just using me as a servant. And I wonder what is your focus in life? When the hard things hit, when the prayers aren't answered, what are you focusing on? A lot of us, we focus on finances, right? School, kids, what am I going to do about this? What am I going to do about that? And this is what Jesus says in Matthew six thirty three. He says the answer to this and all this worry. Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously and he will give you everything you need. That's another easy one to read, but a hard one to live out, right? What does that require from us to seek the kingdom of God? It means you have to wake up and ask God, what do you want me to do today? And I would ask you, are you desperate for the Holy Spirit? Truly. Does anybody want to see revival, right? You want to see like what I've, what I've only read about where, you know, there's constant healing and tent revivals and people are coming to Jesus left and right. Don't you want to see that? No? Nobody else wants to see it? Oh, Lord, help us. That only happens because they woke up. God, what do you want from me today? I'm desperate for your spirit. I can't do anything in my own power. I need you to move on my behalf. And that strips a lot of that worry and anxiety away because you're no longer focusing on that. You're focusing on Jesus. You're focusing on the mission that God has given you. And a lot of you, I feel like you don't even know what your mission is. And that's because you're not spending that time with Jesus for him to tell you. It's very easy for us as Christians to get into a routine, right? We know the scriptures. We come to church. We sing the songs. But it's not real. Your heart's not crying out for Jesus. It's not crying out for the Holy Spirit to empower you. You're just playing this thing. Don't. You're not helping yourself. Remember Jesus talked about the church in Revelation? Like, I, I wish you weren't lukewarm. Be hot or be cold. Choose one. But if you're lukewarm and you're just straddling the fence and you're just playing this Christian game, he's going to spit you out. A promise from Jesus. There is no I'm halfway in. It's you're all in or you're completely out of the kingdom. Are you in? Do you want to see God flow through you? That's another thing only you can answer. It's your personal time with God. God, Open my, and this guy's yelling at me and being all weird and stuff, but is, is he talking to me? Are you talking to me? Am I that person that's just playing this thing? Or am I all in? Reveal that to me. Amen? We've got to ask, we've got to ask God the hard questions. God, what do you want me to do today? And it's not just sitting around raiding from a voice from heaven, right? Do you know these, these people, super spiritual people? Well, when God speaks to me audibly... It's going to be my, pr no, he gives you his word, he talks to you in your word. You know, I think some people take that parable out of, you know, he feeds the birds of the air and you think God's just going to bring everything to your life. You know what? The birds got to use the wings that God gave them to go find the worms that God put in the ground to bring it back to their nest. There's work involved when you're seeking the kingdom of God. It's not just sitting around waiting for God to just show up and do something miraculous. He has called you and equipped you to do something, to go forward, to pray for someone, to empathize with someone, to bless someone. Stop waiting for it and walk in it. Amen? What are we doing waiting around? For, oh, when the revival gets here, like, start the revival. Let the revival be in your heart first. Let you be so full of God. And guess what? It becomes contagious. People come to watch things burn. If you would burn for Jesus, they're going to come and see what it's all about. If you live this out truly, you'd be amazed at what God does with you. 
if you remain willing. Remain willing. We've got to understand that living for Christ is hard and it's messy. But you won't succeed unless you die to yourself. All the pride, all the ego, it's got to die. It has to die. Are you willing to suffer and struggle for Jesus? If Jesus tomorrow allowed you to lose your job, you got hit by a car, your entire family died, would you still serve him? It's hard questions, right? But that's the type of allegiance Jesus calls us that I'm first and foremost. Look at Job, no matter what's gonna happen, do you really put me first? And he will challenge you in that. Can I share a quick testimony? Is that okay? A little story? Are y'all doing okay? Okay, all right. So um, I struggled with this the last time before we went to Germany um, where I'm, I'm, I'm seeking the kingdom and I'm saying, God, you're, you're my first priority and you're my everything. Um, and he challenged me with, uh, I never... I never knew anyone like Shay, and I never had anyone love me like Shay ever in my life. And uh, he came to me one night, and he said, will you serve me if I take her from you? And you know what I said? Nope. You take her, I'm done. Done. I'm not playing this game. I feel like you've stripped so many things from me in my life. I've gone through so much turmoil. Nope, I'm not. And it was a process of walking with God to where he had to align my heart that he has to be first and foremost. And I finally got to that place. And then he did it again. And he came to me at night and said, okay, so you'll serve me if I take her. I was like, yes, I'll serve you, Lord. You know I will. You're first. He said, will you continue to be in ministry? Will you do missions without her? Nope. No, I will not. Better believe I won't. Yeah, I love you, Lord, but pff, better believe I'm not, I'm not doing this stuff. Um, this is hard. I'm not doing it without her. I'm not doing it alone. No. And he showed me that, that again, my allegiance was more towards her in some areas than it was to him. That, that, that uh, I just, do you ever have those things in your life that maybe until God challenged you, you realize, wow, where they actually sit on your heart? Or you really figure out, God, I'll serve you until those clauses you give to Jesus, right? Like, I'll do this, I'll do this. But if you do this, this is, did you read this in fine print, Lord, when I gave my life to you? If you mess with this part, I'm done. And God wants to completely strip that away. There is no contract you give to God. You're all in and you're all out. And so I remember when I said no to God, Shay got really sick. Really sick. Took her to the doctors. Couldn't figure anything out took her to the emergency room. Nobody had a clue. She, she couldn't really move. She was bedridden. She couldn't really talk. She was completely drained. And I started getting angry, very angry. I stopped reading my Bible. I stopped praying, all while I'm raising money to go to the mission field, right? Let me just remind you where I was and what everyone saw. Everyone saw, oh, look at the good little missionaries going to do military ministry. Oh, it's awesome. Inside, I'm dark and being wicked and upset and angry and dealing with stuff. And let me just remind you, what people show you on the outside is not always what's going on in their heart. That's why we're called to be in community with people and know people to be able to help them because not everyone's going to lay out all of their issues to people they cannot trust. Amen? So I didn't have anyone I'm trusting. And so Shay is awesome. And she's just in bed, half dead, and like, Lord, what are you teaching me? And I'm like, are you for serious? Like, what do you, like, she's still wanting, God, what are you teaching me? Like, she's so holy. And I'm over here like, I'm so upset with God. And, and she, she's like, well, are you teaching Jordan something? Like, God's like, you need to talk to your husband. So she talks to me and it's like, what does God teach you? I was like, I'll tell you what he's teaching me. He's showing me that people that claim they're Christians really aren't Christians because they're praying for you and nothing's happening. So obviously none of these people are real. They don't really love Jesus. I'm not sure if God heals anymore. Like all of these things just come flooding out. And she said, you need to go spend some time with Jesus. I'm like, I don't want to spend time with Jesus. I'm mad at Jesus. She's like, go. So I go downstairs in the dining room. And immediately, it's like God's right there. He's like, if you can't trust me with these things, how are you going to trust me with everything else that's going to come your way? 
you've got to put me first. And I'm like breaking down. I'm like, God, I'm so sorry. I messed up. I need your help. And so she ends up taking a shower and then God speaks to her in the shower and says, okay, you're, you're, you're healed now. I dealt with Jordan and she was fine. Next day woke up completely fine. Craziness, right? It is awesome. It is awesome. I was really worried and scared for a while. But I'm just letting you know that as a personal testimony that God wants your undevoted attention. And when he brings those opportunities to challenge you, it's not so he can know where you're at. It's so you can know where you're at. Suffering is a part of the kingdom. You will be persecuted. And if you haven't yet, give it a minute. It's coming. That's a promise. But there's also a promise that we make, we make it out of here in great conditions. We get to spend eternity with Jesus forever and ever and ever. Amen. Hallelujah. Somebody shout for like five seconds. Thank Jesus if you're excited about that. Come on. And though I know that, and though I understand I'm in spiritual warfare, I often look at my own insecurities. And I wonder if you're like me. Where you're like, I'm not good. I'm not worthy. I'm not really that equipped. <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing half the time. I'm just in this thing. And, and you know, we all make mistakes. We mess up. And, uh, you know, the world kind of looks at us when a Christian sins. And it's like, they know more scripture than we do sometimes. You know what I mean? All the, all the things they can point out. And, uh, you know... They call us hypocrites. But if anything, I'd say we're not hypocrites. We're just consistent. Like, we, we consistently come back to Jesus. Like, yeah, you're right. I, I do need you. And so it's not like I'm a hypocrite. Like, I think I'm It's like, no, I, I know I'm a mess. And only Jesus can save me. Only he can redeem me. Only he can flow through me. It's all him. It's not my goodness. My goodness is nothing. It's all him. That's the message we should share back with those people that think they know what they're talking about. Like, no, actually, we need Jesus. And guess what? You do too, because you're not really as good as you think. Like, get through the first, first few pages of the Bible, and God, like, kills everybody with a flood. You know what I mean? Like, people are not good, all right? We need Jesus. We need his righteousness. And so I want to encourage you with what Paul says in 2 Corinthians um, chapter 4, verses 7, and then I'll jump to verse 7, 16. This is Paul talking about us as Christians. He says, we now have this light shining in our hearts, but we ourselves are like fragile clay jars containing this great treasure. And this makes it clear that our great power is from God, not from ourselves. And that is why we never give up. Though our bodies are dying, our spirits are being renewed every day. That's a hopeful message. Coming to that realization like, wow, yeah, I'm not special and I am broken and I have faults and I've messed up so much and I've screwed so many things up and I still don't treat my wife the way that I should. I still don't parent my kids the best that I could. And yet, God, you still want to use me? Yep, he does. He wants to use the broken, the people that feel like they aren't called, the people that feel they aren't equipped, the people that read through the Bible and don't know what's going on really half the time. That's why you spend more time in it. But God wants to use all these broken people. If you look at the disciples, they were a mess. And we are here because they walked this out. They trusted Jesus. What's your legacy going to be? What's the legacy of your life? Because I want to remind you, we will all stand before Jesus. And you know what you won't be thinking about? Your finances your job, all these other things you worry about now, you're going to come face to face with the Lord of glory. What's your legacy going to be? Amen? God wants to use you. You are his image on display, no matter how broken you are or have been. You're his image. And so I want to remind you that we are allowed to be bold. Despite our mess ups, we can go boldly to the throne because again, it's not your works that you're going to God. It's not your righteousness. It is Jesus's righteousness that he puts on you because of your faith.
so you don't have to be ashamed to go to God with issues or pray to Jesus. You go boldly to the throne. When you pray for people, don't be ashamed because you messed up that morning. You go boldly because it's God flowing through you. It's not about you. It's about him. And you're pointing other people to him. You are a fragile clay jar, and it's the power of God that lives in you and wants to get out. He wants to shine through your broken areas, shine through all your mistakes and everything else. Because when people can look at that person and look at you and say, they did all that, and God still uses it. Yeah, he can use you too. You don't have to be perfect. He wants you where you're at. Amen. That's our message. That's how we should live this out. And there's no separation from his love. There's not. Not our own fears and worries. No power or authority in the unseen realms. Nothing can separate you from God as long as you continue to follow him. Amen. So I want to share this last verse and then I'll, I'll, I'll be quiet. Um, this is a verse that's uh, really powerful and, and I think should be a goal of us as Christians. It's in Habakkuk chapter 3, verses 17 through 19. It says, even though the fig trees have no blossoms and there are no grapes on the vines, even though the olive crop fails and the fields lie empty and barren, even though the flocks die in the field and the cattle barns are empty, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in the God of my salvation. The sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes me as sure-footed as a deer, able to tread upon the heights. Now this posture that Habakkuk's talking about, if you look at it, I mean, this, this, when you're in an agricultural culture or whatever else, this is, this is really bad news. You can't see any provision. You can't see, it doesn't look like God's on your side right now, right? It looks like you're being attacked and yet Habakkuk knows God is there and I'm going to rejoice in the God of my salvation. I'm going to continue to trust him when everything else looks chaotic and a mess and there doesn't seem to be any hope. And this posture can be heard, but it has to be experienced to be real. This remnant of God's people that despite however it looks, I'm going to continue to serve you. I'm going to continue to love you. I'm going to continue to live this out. When everyone makes fun of me and I look like a fool and I'm praying for people constantly and, and nothing's happened, I'm going to continue to trust in you, God, because I know you're going to do it. I know your timing is perfect and I'm not going to look at everything else to determine my faith. I'm not going to let my circumstances say what my faith is. I trust in you, Jesus. And so the true remnant has battle scars. And they learn how to trust Jesus when there seems like no one else is there. When nothing else is there to help you and everything's stacked against you. The remnant, they trust Jesus. Though it may be hard and it's not easy, they're focusing all of themselves onto him. And if your joy in relationship with Jesus is only stable when things are okay and convenient, then it's probably too shallow to last. Prosperity gospel sounds good. Health, wealth, bless you constantly. In reality, it doesn't always work that way. It does not, but it grows our faith. In Romans 5, talks about this. It's, it's suffering leads to endurance, which leads to character, which leads to hope. There's always a purpose in it. And I want to share one last, one last little story real fast. That's okay. Y'all okay? Okay, and then I'll shut up, and then I'll leave, all right? Um, the other day, uh, a couple months back, I was, you know, you learn a lot of things, how God is as a parent when you become a parent, is what I've learned. <laughs> it's kind of weird, and it's kind of funny, and, but it helps you appreciate how much he actually does love you, too, and like more so. And I remember with, with Delaney, um, we're about to leave somewhere, and I'm trying to get her bag ready, and she's just like, hold me, hold me, uh, crying like it's the end of the world, right? And I'm like, just calm down, like I'm just trying to get your bottles and everything else, but she couldn't see that, Right? And I was preparing something to help her for the trip, but she was so focused on just the issue that she couldn't see what I was doing for her. And I want to remind you that God's ways and his thoughts are higher than our thoughts and ways. And a lot of things you're going through is just to prepare you and help you for the journey and task ahead. And so in those moments, instead of bickering and screaming at God, just sit in his presence and trust him. 
Trust him. That's faith. And he is going to get you through it. Amen? So I have two things. Um, first off, I, I, my plea for you today is that you would partner with me and my wife to reach our troops overseas. I, I really, really know they need to hear the gospel. And, and they're literally laying down their lives and taking their families across the world to serve our nation. And, and they need Jesus for the sake of their future, for the longevity, for their souls. They need Jesus. I'm asking you to partner with us in whatever way. But also, I, my plea is that you would burn bright for Jesus here in this community where you live, where you work, that people would see you and know that you love Jesus that you would share Jesus, you would pray for them, you would love them, you would do your best to live a holy life and not let grace be a license to sin, but let it be an empowerment to not sin. Amen? So I'm asking you to do that for the sake of this community here that needs the gospel and needs Jesus and your family that needs the gospel and needs Jesus. The Great Commission is a gift to the church because it keeps us close to God. To disciple and love people means you need to be connected to Jesus or you're not gonna do it right at all. Not everyone can be discipled the same way. And so uh, have you failed at being holy? Anybody failed at being holy? Me too. You made mistakes? Yep. Was last week terrible probably? Maybe. Maybe you didn't do good. But Proverbs says the righteous fall down seven times, but get back up the eighth. It's about getting back up. Amen. So if you would just bow your heads real quick. Um, I, never, I never want to um, preach or share the gospel without giving an opportunity for those to commit their lives to Christ or rededicate their lives to Christ. So if that's you, if you're feeling convicted by Jesus to give your life to him and make him Lord, and maybe it's you've been faking it, but now you want it to be real and you want to get involved with him and what he wants you to do, would you just slip up your hand real quick? And I just want to pray for you. If there's anyone out there. Awesome, awesome, awesome. I'm going to take that as all of you love Jesus. So that means there's, you all have a mission. You all have tasks. And he wants to flow through you if you would let him. So let's just pray together. Lord Jesus, we just ask that you would fill us up with your spirit again and anew, God. Lord, we repent of all the things we've made mistakes with. We repent for not seeking you first and foremost every day. And we just ask that you would continually grow us, Lord, that you would challenge us, Lord God, that you would encourage us and help us to be able to walk this out, Lord, that you would bring people around us that would lift our heads, Lord Jesus, that, that, and bring people around that we can lift up, that we can disciple, that we can love, Lord God. I pray if there's anyone here that hasn't been discipled, that, that someone would be sent to them to disciple them, God. And vice versa, if there's anyone here that has been discipled, but they're not discipling, that they would disciple someone, that they would go after someone, Lord, that they would see people as you see them, worthy of your sacrifice and love, Lord. I pray that we would sacrifice ourselves to look and act and think like you, Jesus, and see the big picture, not just what we see with our own eyes. God, we praise you and we give you glory. And everyone says, amen, amen. Pastor Terry. Hey, Amen. good word, Jordan, good word. I was riding my mower yesterday, mowing my yard. <clears throat> And uh, something happened, and uh, God spoke to my heart and gave me a message. I'm going to preach in a couple of weeks, actually, as I was mowing my yard. I get a lot of messages mowing my yard. But uh, it sort of goes along with what you were saying today. <clears throat> no, we need to flesh out this gospel. It can't be just something we have on Sunday morning, Wednesday night. So we need to flesh it out. We need to live it out. We're not perfect, but God wants to help us to live 
this gospel out. Amen. You know, <clears throat> Jordan said a couple of things about the military that they deserve to have the gospel preached to them. Well, the truth is, everyone deserves to have the gospel preached to them. Everyone deserves to hear the gospel for the first time. You and I hear it every Sunday morning. We hear it multiple times. Some of them have never heard the gospel. So we need to hear the gospel preached to them. But not only do they deserve to have the gospel preached to them, they desperately need the gospel preached to them. I remember when the army recruiter sat in our house, in our living room, just signed Chris up to join the army. What a thrilling day it was. We were so excited. Not. The little recruiter wanted to slap him, but you know, but he looked over at Kim and I and said, you won't recognize your son when he comes out of basic training. You won't recognize your son. Now he was talking about that Chris was going to put on pounds. I mean, just bulk up like the Hulk. Chris went in the army weighing 135 pounds, came out of basic training weighing 136 pounds. He absolutely bulked up. I mean, that one pound was very noticeable, <laughs> very noticeable on him. But the truth is, and this is my son-in-law too, they both went into the army and when they came out, they were different. They were different. They were different than what we sent them in. And not for the best. Not for the best. They learned things in the army that they didn't learn in our house or didn't learn in our church. Chris served as a chaplain's assistant for 17 years. And I was amazed by what you said about only two assembly guide churches in that area. <clears throat> Chris served with a Lutheran pastor. I don't know if you know what Lutherans believe and I'm not gonna get into denominational differences this morning. And I can tell you, they don't believe what you and I believe. The way that the Lutheran pastor would, or chaplain would come back and deal with stuff that they dealt with on the, on the battlefield was to open his drawer, pull out a bottle of something and drink it. And Chris did the same thing. They would pull out a bottle of whiskey or whatever the case might be, or go to the, get beer and they would... They would do that. That's how they dealt with it. Well, that's not how you and I learn to deal with things. So they come out different. Not only do they deserve to hear the gospel, they desperately need to hear the gospel. I tell you, I fall in love with missionaries, but I, have, I'm, I am falling in love with Jordan and Shay. I believe that God has planted them there for a purpose. You know, our church, when I, as pastor, I try to look at our missionaries and we try to get people that do, we don't want to, we don't want to send 20 missionaries to Spain. We don't want to send five missionaries to Mexico. We try to broaden our outreach and we have nobody in military chaplaincy that we support. So tonight, today, about a month ago actually, our board made the decision before we even knew Jordan, before they even knew Jordan, I knew Jordan, before they knew Jordan, they made a decision that we were gonna support Jordan for a hundred dollars a month. We're gonna do that. Because it's an outreach in an area that we don't even go into. I'll tell you more next week about some other things that we're gonna do, but we're gonna support you guys for $100 a month. That isn't 
a great deal perhaps you may not think but it'll make a difference and we're going to make a difference and we're going to do that this morning we want to receive an offering for Jordan and Shay so would you prepare your check cash whatever you want to do drop your credit card in there they'll return it after they maxed it out uh, if I can have four of the handsomest guys in my church I need four of the four handsome guys four of the, to help us with our offering this morning there's a bag up here David I thought it was funny that Tyler and Steve jumped up first <laughs> amen amen we want to bless this family and help them to reach their goal. They have, they have goals they have to reach before they can go. They're wanting to be uh, deployed or shipped out about the end of the year. So we've got six months for them to get their monies raised and their funding, uh, their monthly support raised as well. So we're going to give them a head start in that today. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for the ministry that we've heard today. Lord, we thank you for the dedication, the heart, and the desire to reach the military personnel. We pray, God, today that you would just continue to open the door there. God, we're going to plant a seed. We're going to plant a seed through Jordan and Shay, right in the middle of the devil's playground. And we're going to claim lives for the kingdom of God in Jesus' name. Bless this offering, and we give you praise for it in your name. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Again, I want to invite you to join us this evening. Uh, it's just a fellowship night. You can roller skate if you want to, if you're daring enough to do that. But uh, we've provided the means for you to have a good time with our family and fellowship with our church. Uh, bring some games if you want to bring some. We're going to bring some phase 10 because I am a killer at phase 10 now. And uh, we're... We'll have a good time tonight, 6 to 8 at the Ida Bell Skating Rink. Come and join us. Come and join us and uh, have a great day tonight. Well, God bless you, uh, Shay, and, and uh, Jordan will be at the table out in front. Make sure you pick up an army man and also a prayer card.